I don't know how to put this, but I'm kind of a big deal. Houston, we have a problem. That they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! in your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Please. Get busy living. You get busy dying. Keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody. I'm your number one fan. There's no crying. There's no crying in baseball. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. This is supposed to be a happy occasion. Let's not bicker and argue about who killed who. Hello and welcome to My Celluloid Heart. Uh, Sorry for that intro, but I am working on getting a new theme song made. And uh, it will hopefully be out in two weeks when the next show comes up. But for now, this is my new show, new format. I've erased all the other shows uh, that I had on this channel. I changed a name. It was It's Kind of a Funny Podcast. Now it's My Celluloid Heart because I love movies. And I, you know, it was too hard to come up with different random things. And I love movies so much that I thought this would be the best way to do it. Um, Because... All my friends love movies. I always talk to my friends about movies, no matter what. So, it's it's in my blood. But, let me explain to you a little about me. I've written some stuff down, so excuse if it sounds like I'm reading, but I had to write it down to get it formatted so I know what to talk about. But, anyway, the first movie that I remember seeing in the theaters is Empire Strikes Back in 1980. It was a special thing. My dad took my mom, even though my... And my dad didn't, he worked a little. My mom more worked than my dad did. But uh, took us to the theater and out to eat because I remember we went to buy the ticket and they were sold out. And I think I remember being like upset. Like all these people were in line. I was upset that we weren't going to see. I'm sure that I wanted to see it because it looked so amazing probably on the previews. And um, so we went ahead and bought a ticket for the next show. So I got lucky. I thought my dad would be like, fuck this noise. And uh, I was, at that time, I was nine. So uh, I was born in 71. This is 1980. Uh, So we bought a ticket for the next show, and then my dad took us to Denny's, and we ate. And then I remember walking into the theater and sitting down. The screen was so big. And the image of that movie that I remember the most, I can put myself in that chair. I know where I was sitting when I look up on the screen. The image that I remember the most from seeing the movie then was Luke on the Tauntaun. It was such a great image and a great movie, of course, but that image I remember going like, is that dinosaur? Like, what is that? Like, what the hell is going on? And I don't even think that I'd seen Star Wars until after I saw Empire, but I I don't know. I'm not sure, but I think I'm probably retarded for that because I, you know, would have been six when Star Wars came out, but for some reason... Maybe I didn't know, but somehow I knew. I must have seen Star Wars right before Empire. It's probably probably what it was, now that I think about it. My uh, memories are a little foggy. The second time I remember going to a movie with my family was 1982 for E.T. And again, we went out to the theater, saw this movie. This is where the real powers, power of the movie kicked in for me. Power of movies in general kicked in. I remember watching the movie and crying when E.T. died. I was crying so hard that my mom and dad had to quiet me down. So at this time now, I'm 11 years old. And when he's in the icebox and Elliot is crying, you see his chest glow, meaning that he's okay. But Elliot is too busy looking down and crying and walking away. 
Just then, the flower that is dying as Elliot walks by begins to gain new life and start to bloom or rebloom. Elliot does see that. And I'm still crying, but happy that E.T. is alive, but wanting, you know, Elliot, look, look, hurry up and look. Elliot runs to the icebox to open it. He unzips the bag, and E.T. says, Elliot, Elliot. Now I'm laughing, like before I was crying. Then I'm happy, but still crying with lumps in my throat. Now I'm laughing and really happy. Elliot tries to quiet him down. I'm still laughing. Later, toward the end of the movie, I was happy because E.T. was going home to his family. At this point now, my mom was crying because E.T. was leaving. I said, it's okay, Mom. He's going home. So that was cute. Um, And for some reason, and maybe because I'm an only child, I've been trying to figure this out. I think it is because I'm an only child. I didn't have, like, I wasn't a blue-collar family. I mean, my cousin had, his dad worked for, like, the government, doing, like, the street work, doing all that construction, whatever you call it. And so he was a little upper middle class. I was lower middle class. Uh, some say white trash. But I, I had, we had some money. We bought a Tandy TRS-80. I remember my mom brought that home. It was a computer. And I'm like, we have a computer? And it was like 1983 or whenever those came out. I don't even know how she bought it, where she came up with the money, but she did. So I remember, so like I said, for some reason, because I'm an only child, I fell in love with movies. All my life has been me telling my friends trivia from movies that they usually don't care about. I won tickets once from the radio station in like 1990 because they said, if anyone knows how Harrison Ford got the scar on his chin, call in and let us know and you win two free tickets to see Darkman. I had no idea what Darkman was. I think I'd seen a preview maybe because this is before the internet was big. And I was just like, "What? what is that? I don't know. But I called, got through, and answered the question. I said, did he wrap his car around a pole? The woman said, yes, he did. So I took my friend Joe, uh, who I've known since 1978. He'll be on the show sometime. And if you've heard our old shows, you know who Joe is. But we've known each other for 40 years. Uh, Took him to go see Darkman, and we loved it. A time that I remember a movie hitting me so powerfully was also around this time. It was a movie called The Killer with Chow Yun-Fat. It was a Hong Kong action movie, and it was was so good. If you guys have not seen The Killer with Chow Yun-Fat, directed by John Woo, it is, oh my God, so, I think it's written and directed by John Woo. Like, I mean, now maybe it's dated, but it is so good, so good. Um, My cousin Chip and I had rented this movie from the comic book store, After we watched it, I was blown away by the action and just all the cool stuff in the movie. My cousin loved it too, but he was tired and he went on to bed. I asked my aunt and uncle because it was their house and they were kind of awake then because it was a morning. And I said, uh, hey, can I can I watch that again? And they said, sure. So I remember wanting to watch it a third time after I got done watching it that second time, but had to go to sleep. It was such a great movie. Like I said, you guys need to see The Killer and Hard Boiled. Oh, so good. So, you know, just uh, see them as soon as possible. Then I remember when my friend David and I were watching this show. It's like my trivia, useless trivia shit that nobody cares about. Even my wife, I tell her something. But I went with my friend Dave, and him and I were watching Wayne's World in the theater. And I turned to him and I said, hey, you know that Dana Carvey really knows how to play the drums. He said, my friend Bob plays the drums. I said, who's Bob? He said, exactly. I was like, motherfucker. So I I knew that he didn't care, but I just had to tell somebody like, hey, I know this info. So if you're into movies, you know how you'll have some trivia info in your head and you want to tell somebody. And you got to find those certain people that love movies like you do that you can talk to about it. And it's it's always great when you do find somebody like that. And then I remember uh, in 1994, uh, I went and saw Pulp Fiction. And I loved it so much that I went back with my dad and his friend. Then I took all my friends and paid for them all to go see Pulp Fiction. There was about six of us, and we had such a good time. And 
just everybody was like, oh, Philip, like, what about this? And they're asking me questions about Quentin Tarantino because I'm reading all the articles and I'm reading all this stuff about Quentin because he was my guy and he just knew the history of movies like all the way through. And it was just through history, like knows almost everything. And well, probably maybe knows everything. And with the Internet now, I find myself not retaining as much or thinking about it because then I end up just looking on the internet uh, for the answer. You know, who was in that movie, blah, blah, blah. But um, also in that same year, I don't remember if it was before or after Pulp Fiction, but it was 94, and I won some more tickets to go see Ed Wood. And I had no idea who this guy was, but I knew that it was Tim Burton, uh, Johnny Depp. I knew that it was, you know, looked like a good movie. And me and three other friends... Um, went to see that movie. It blew me away and was so great. I just, because of him loving movies and wanting to make a movie. And at that time, I had wanted to make a movie and was working on a script, but had not finished the script yet and was just going to make it with my friends and was trying to make a movie. It's just, you know, all this stuff that I loved. And that was Ed Wood, a guy who makes shitty movies, but he makes what he wants and has a passion for it. And it was just, it was so great. And I, oh, I just, and so I, I own that movie and it, it was so great. Um, and then I remember I took a friend of mine to go see Fargo because I had seen Fargo, I think, by myself in 96. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like this movie is so fucked up and funny that I love it, and it's my favorite. It's so great. I got to take my friend to go see it. So uh, I took her to go see it. I was like, oh, what do you think? What do you think? It's really great, right? And we walked out of the theater, and she was like, she was like freaked out by it, and she was like, I can't believe that you like that movie. Like, that's weird. Like, it was messed up, and they threw that guy in the wood chipper, and spoiler alert, and all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, but, it was so great. And she just kind of, I think, looked at me a little different. Like, you like that? That's weird. Um, so <laughs> then another uh, movie experience where something hit me pretty hard. Was, and all through the years, movies have hit me. But these are certain ones of remembering certain instances. So in like 99, whenever when Boondock Saints came out, I, I rented it from Blockbuster because I saw a preview on a tape. I rented Boondock Saints. I watched it. I was like, oh, my God, that is fucking awesome. So then I went to Blockbuster, and I said, hey, when are those going to be previously viewed? And they told me. And then I went, and I bought four copies for four of my friends. And I am sitting there, and I remember the guy goes, you know that you have four of those of the same movie, right? I said, yeah, I know. It's a great fucking movie. I'm going to give it to my friends. He was like, okay. I probably didn't use the word fucking. Um, so I had to share that movie with uh so many people um and in total for me i own probably 330 blu-rays and about 200 dvds so maybe that helps understand like my taste in movies or what i like and as we go through the show you know right now this is a little stilted because i'm trying to make a format and i have to change it up and i had to do some research and all this good stuff so um pretty exciting but um the uh, I also really love when a movie can tug at my heart and make me cry, just like E.T. Because um, what had happened with E.T. that I kind of didn't explain that I really understood was 20 years later, I went and saw E.T., the 20th anniversary, where they took out all the guns out of their hands and gave them walkie-talkies. Was, um, but if you think about it, they have guns because this thing's an alien. You don't know what kind of powers he has. He could kill you with a laser beam out of his eyes or whatever. Um, so he, uh, so it's 20 years later. I go to see that movie, and I know how the movie goes. I know it beat for beat. I know what's going to happen. Da, 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 da. Um, E.T.'s in the hospital. Elliot's in the hospital. E.T.'s gray. He's going to die. Um then he dies, then I'm sad, and then that scene happens. The icebox, 
Keys, the guy who's known as Keys, if you the Peter Coyote character, uh, tells him go ahead and say your goodbyes. Keys walks away, and he uh, and Elliot's crying, and you see the box light up. Elliot turns around to walk by the plant. The plant starts to bloom. He turns around. All of a sudden, I'm crying, even though I know E.T. lives. I know it, but I'm still crying because E.T.'s dead, because Elliot is hurting. So now I'm crying. Elliot turns around, opens the icebox, unzips it. The whole thing, exactly as it was 20 years ago. I was crying, then I'm laughing, got a lump in my throat, like all that greatness. So... Uh, so it's stuff like that, that I'm a big baby when it comes to movies and TV, emotional scenes like Lethal Weapon TV show. Like I would get choked up at certain scenes that were like, you know, that and some other shows that I've watched that I get a little choked up. Um, and my wife, <laughs> my wife tells me, you know, I could die or something really bad could happen to me and you wouldn't be sad or cry. But God forbid that I think some toys were going to get burned up at the end of Toy Story 3 and I cry big time. You know, got all choked up with a lump in my throat and tears are rolling down my cheek. And I'm seeing Toy Story 3 by myself in the theater and I'm crying. And my wife makes fun of me for that because she's like, they're not going to kill off their main characters, their main Disney characters. It's a children's movie. They're not going to kill Woody and Buzz Lightyear and all of them. Like, it just isn't going to happen. So she's not invested. I go to a different place. I think she. Some people, not just her, some people can watch a movie, take themselves out of it a little bit and see that it's a movie and not understand the writing or the emotion of it to get you like just hooked. And that's where I'm at. Like I'm just, oh. And so like the Yondu scene, the Yondu scene in Guardians of the Galaxy 2 where he's like, I'm Mary Poppins, y'all. That had the same effect, almost pretty much, that E.T. had. Like, it was powerful. It was it was that he was going to die. It was or that he did die. It was that he uh, he was like, the oh, is she cool? Mary Poppins cool? And he's like, yeah, Mary Poppins cool. And he's like, oh, okay. And it was just so, so great. Like, you were sad and happy and all of that. Um. So I just, oh, the power of movies, so great. Um, It's not just the blockbusters or movies that I grew up with. It's also like the the classics and not like Pretty in Pink, but like Citizen Kane, North by Northwest, The Great Dictator, like all these old movies I love very much. And I can't even explain why. It's the Hollywood history of it, but also I love to see the mechanics of how they made the movies back then. And my favorite of those type of movies are film noir, like The Killers. So I talked about The Killer, which is Chow Yun Fat. The Killers is by Stanley Kubrick, and they rob a horse track. And it's really good. It was, I think, 59 or late 50s. Really good. Directed by Stanley Kubrick. So great. And I don't get as emotional with the classic movies. Because sometimes it's over the top acting. If it's like a silent film, they have to over act because of uh, there being no sound. But also sometimes just there's not really a lot of heart and substance in it in a movie back then because it was just let's make this good story. And maybe they didn't have a lot of, you know, heart. There was one called, um, ah. It was called, ah, I can't think of it. But there was one that I saw in Turner Classic Movies once. I had to look it up and find what it was called. And it was called, ah, it's on the tip of my tongue. Anyway, it was great where it was a guy who had lost hand amnesia and didn't remember being married to this woman. And he was living this other life and then finally he goes back to the house somehow gets back in touch with her and he's walking to the gate and he realizes it all comes back to him then that he loves her and all of his memories come back and it was it was so great it's called fuck something with an r anyway i'll get back to you on the next show with that one the um 
but uh but anyway that with the um the killers is a great one um and i love i love them so much like not just the film noirs you know i love all those classics i watched i went and saw the great dictator at the movie at uh at the phoenix um art museum and um it was just really it was free and we sat down and everybody laughed and it was oh, it was just like it was brand new. Even though we all knew it, we were all laughing. It was oh, it was so good. And there were people brought kids in there who had never seen it. They loved it. Like it was, it was just awesome. And one of my favorite movies of all time. I had a discussion with my friend Joe a long time ago about if we we're on a desert island and you had to watch one movie over and over again. That's always a difficult one for any movie lover. Mine was Raiders of the Lost Ark. I remember uh, I saw that in the theater. Um, probably not first run. It was like, you know, re- it was when it was in the dollar theater and I'm swinging from the, from the bathroom stalls. And I remember cut my hand a little bit and stuff, but it was, it was fun. I was trying to be Indiana Jones. Um, and then it's not just the great ones and the classic ones and the good ones. I have my guilty pleasures that I watch and stuff like that. Um, and I sometimes love cheesy and outrageous movies, but I have to be in the mood for them, like a period piece or a heavy drama or like Moonlight, that movie Moonlight. I had to be in a certain mood for it, and then I watched it, and I was like, that was good, but eh, you know, so that one. Uh, but um, but period pieces and heavy dramas, you got to be in the mood for, for me at least. Um, I have, I've been to see Rocky Horror Picture Show several times. I love it. I love singing to it. I love the soundtrack. I love the acting out of it. I know all, most of the, you know, the lines that you say and every state has different lines that they say, so that's always good. Um I had a blast watching with my friend Sean and I. We watched Chopping Mall um on the podcast, uh on the old podcast and we made uh commentary to it and uh we had never seen it before and it was fun and we laughed and, you know, had a great time. Um, Roger Corman movies are usually fun to watch. The other day I watched um, Big Bad Mama, and now there's Big Bad Mama 2 that I got to watch. But uh, Big Bad Mama was with um, Angie Dickinson, and she has these two daughters, and she's hurting for money, and they end up getting in a predicament where they end up having to kill certain people and then rob banks and rob people. And it's got, uh, you know the guy from alien in it the first alien um it's got william shatner in it um it's good good stuff good fun stuff because it's not meant to be taken serious because they know that they don't have enough money to make what they want so they make what they can um there can be some movies though that aren't fun cheesy like the trauma pictures sometimes those are but like you watch some of those and you're just like oh like but you know that there's there's people out there that watch those. There's some people that really like those. Um, so my thing for this show, my idea, and like I said, this is the first one. It'll get better, of course, as it goes. On this podcast, you can expect movie reviews, movie trivia, movie history, trailer reviews, uh, movie news, hidden gems, and you should check, uh, And oh, hidden gems that you should check out. Like, you know, like hidden ones, like, I'm looking at uh, a poster right now on my wall called The Long Kiss Goodnight. And it's got uh, Gina Davis and Samuel Jackson in it. And it was written by um, Shane Black and directed by Rennie Harlan, who at the time was dating Gina Davis. Shane Black has written Lethal Weapon movie, the first one. He's written and directed Iron Man 3. Uh, he's currently, he did uh, The Predator the predator um he was in the predator the, i mean he was in predator the original and he also um he did uh wrote and directed kiss kiss bang bang and he wrote and directed uh mr nice guy or sorry the nice guys and um those are great films if you haven't seen those you got to see kiss kiss bang bang and uh the night uh, the nice guys Um, so good, so good. Um, so, but anyway, um, so I'll be, uh, Hidden Gems You Should See, and then some streaming shows that I'll review 
that are on Netflix, Amazon, or Hulu, because those are the three things that I have. So I'll watch some shows on there, let you know. So I hope you enjoy it, because I love to talk about all kinds of movies, from silent to sci-fi. Should be fun for all of us. So I am letting you into my celluloid heart. So that's uh, about me. And you can send any questions or comments to me at mycelluloidheart at gmail.com. And um, some of the newest things, there are things that I watched recently. So I'd seen them already. I watched The Departed. I saw it uh, before when it first came out in the theaters. And it was amazing. And I had seen the original called Infernal Affairs. It's like a Hong Kong movie. And they made three of them. And I remember watching that going, oh, my God, this is so good. Like a cop who's undercover as a bad guy and a bad guy who's undercover as a cop. Oh, my God, this is so good. And I was like, they should make this. And then all of a sudden it said, oh, Martin Scorsese has made a deal to make this movie. And I was like, awesome. And then they were like, and Jack Nicholson's going to be in it. I was like, sweet. So Jack Nicholson, Leonardo DiCaprio, um, uh, Mark Wahlberg, Alec Baldwin, like, oh, all these great people are in it. Uh, the guy from um, the Pacific um, who was in Iron Man 3, um, he's he's great in it. They're all great. Um, and it and so you watch that movie and you're like, oh, man, it's so good. And at the end, you're just kind of like, oh, man, like, you're really like wanting this thing to happen. And when it doesn't, like my wife doesn't like that movie because it doesn't end like she wants it to. But sometimes those are the greatest movies when they don't end like you think they're going to or something like that. But um, yeah, it was it was really good. And I think the original ended that way too. Um, I think I started to watch the second one, the Hong Kong action movie. And um, not really action, uh, drama action, whatever. And I uh, never, never got through it because it wasn't as good as the first one because they were just, I think, cashing in on the name. Um, but that's a good one. You should definitely see that. came out in like 96. I th no, not 96. What am I talking about? Like 2006, I believe is what it said. Um, so you should definitely check that movie out. I don't want to give too much away, but... Uh, so I, I chose to kind of not give the endings of the things that I'm reviewing away because you want to see them. If you haven't seen them, I don't want to run it for you. But The Departed is, like I said, these two recruits go through. One recruit has been, um, and this is all told in the beginning, um, Matt Damon. Sorry, Matt Damon also. <laughs> I said Mark Wahlberg. I didn't even mention the other Boston boy. Matt Damon is kind of in cahoots with uh he knows the the bad mob guy you know he knows jack nicholson jack nicholson puts him and some other boys in through the police academy and they go through the police academy and then they can let jack nicholson know anything that might be coming his way and they can warn him and all this stuff on the other end leonardo DiCaprio, who's kind of a nobody who's coming up in the police ranks uh or you know getting out of the getting out of uh the police academy and they call him in and say hey how would you like to investigate this thing and he's like okay and they go we're going to kick you out of the police force but you'll still be like working for us undercover so he goes and does that and there's all this cat and mouse stuff and it is so good martin scorsese does you know some of his best work this one goodfellas you know all of his movies are good um but you know goodfellas is one of my favorite the Departed is probably uh, my third favorite. My second favorite is Wolf of Wall Street. Um, I love, of course, Mean Streets. Uh, the uh, Raging Bull. Raging Bull might be up there fourth, something, you know, third or fourth. So uh, I might have to rearrange some things. But uh, yeah, those are my favorite Scorsese. So he does good. If you haven't seen it, definitely check it out. It's on Netflix right now. So you can check it out pretty easy. The next uh, newest thing that I watched that I just got done with uh, like last weekend was Orange is the New Black. And it's uh, it was season six. I've been watching. I remember at first I was like, I'm not going to watch it. 
And then my sister-in-law was like, oh, do you watch it? And her and my other sister-in-law were like, oh, you haven't watched it? You should watch it. And I was like, eh, yeah, maybe I'll check it out. And I watched that first episode, and I was like, oh, my God, I'm hooked. And so I've watched every season so far. This sixth season was good because it was different. Like, the other ones were all, they were in that place. On the fifth season, there was a riot. So on the sixth season, they're all separated. And they all, and they're all in a real prison where there's gangs, this gang here and this gang here, and there's different gangs, and they have to affiliate with them. And they can't really be as close to their friends as it used to be, and it's totally different. And so it's really interesting. And um, Mackenzie Phillips is in it, and she was in uh, One Day at a Time back in the day. She's a real a real life heroin addict back in the day. She got fired from uh, One Day at a Time because of that. And um, but she does really good in this, like good acting, and um, the two main bad girls, like they're good, and all the regular cast of Orange Is the New Black is so good. And the season ends, like, so great. Like, oh, so I can't wait for season seven. Like any good show, you can't wait then for the next season. Some shows, you know, you do have where you're like, I didn't really like that season. I remember Psych. I didn't really like the last season of Psych because it felt like they just did another season just to do it. So they had some good episodes, but the whole season wasn't really good. They could have ended at season seven. I think they had eight seasons. Could have ended at season season seven. It would have been fine. But anyway. Um then uh my wife and I we had movie pass. I'm sure you've all probably heard about the horrors of movie pass. At first it was ten dollars a month and you could go see one movie a day for thirty days. For every day of the month you could go see a movie and all you paid was ten bucks a month. And it was a great thing. Then all of a sudden they start changing and they said, okay, now you can, you can't go to the same movie. Like if I want to go see um, Avengers Infinity War again, I couldn't because it was already blacked out after I saw it once. So I could only do that. Um, So they said, okay, we're blocking that down. Then they went to premiere pricing like okay if you're going to see a movie at 7 30 on a friday that's going to cost you a little more three more dollars maybe and so then you're like oh okay i don't like that change but okay i understand then they made it to where okay now certain movies are blacked out for no reason you know and then all of a sudden we my uh my friend's brother sean's brother went to go and he said it was blacked out and he wasn't able to go see mission impossible the whole system was down. And then um, we looked and our system was down. And then that next week we said, well, we're going to go to a movie. We checked it. The movie, The Spy Who Dumped Me, was there on our phone. And we went to go see it. And you had to be within 100 yards of the movie theater. We get there. We go to check in. Boom. Nothing. There's, there's The whole thing is like, not operational so now we're like oh great now we can't go see a movie so my wife's like we're canceling this i said i agree so we both canceled it went in ordered the amc a list dubs member thing where you can see three movies a week for 20 bucks a month so we're each paying 20 so it's 40 bucks a month and we can see you know 12 movies so it's good so we're doing that now um but anyway we went there to see that uh we saw it by who dump me it was fun it was a funny movie it was fun a good little action comedy movie and um but then uh recently we went and saw skyscraper because we'd seen a lot of the other movies nothing else had really came out we saw mission impossible i wasn't going to review it here because everybody's reviewed it the new mission impossible fallout it's really good does all his own stunts except for that motorcycle thing that's all cg but you know the motorcycle rolling off the motorcycle CG, but all the other stuff he does, um, does the halo jumping and all that. But anyway, I said let's go. We'll go see skyscraper. It'll be fun. So I went and saw it, and it was you know as you may have heard if you're into movies. If you're not, skyscraper didn't do very well for The Rock, um, because usually his movies are big hits. Rampage, um, Jumanji, like all those are big hits like right away, like number one. This one was not number one. And 
I think it was because you're doing Die Hard in a building, but Die Hard is in a building. So you're kind of, you're trying to amp it up because now the building's on fire. You can't get here. You got to turn this thing off to turn on the system to reboot it or whatever. And so, and then he had a scene where he puts duct tape on his, does something with the duct tape first on his hands, then puts on his feet and his hands to walk outside to kind of be stuck to the window a little bit. So it seemed like it was, you know, brought to you, skyscraper brought to you by duct tape. And, uh, but it was, it was okay, but it was not like if we had to pay regular money, we wouldn't have went and saw that. So we just went because there was nothing else to see. It was fun. If it was on Redbox, I'd rent it. Dollar fifty, dollar sixty, I'd rent it. Um, the three dollar movies, I'd go see it, but you know, not for twelve bucks. So I can see why people are like, eh, nah. Um, they had some cheesy moments, like, oh, you got to secretly, you know, kind of scurry along over here, and it was just kind of silly. Um, so that's what I've seen uh, recently. Um, like I said, I'm, this is new. I'm still working on trying to fill it in, trying to make it work, uh, for me. So I'm sorry if those newest things that I watched were boring for you that I just said, but please bear with me. Now we're on to film trivia and history is what I call this segment. So I was going to do an anniversary show. I looked, uh, I was talking to my cousin, and he said, oh, you could do a show of, like, movies that came out, like 20-year-old movie, like Sandlot or, you know, all these movies. And I said, oh, okay. So, yeah, that's a good one. So I looked it up, and there's a big list of movies that came out, like, 20 years ago, 30, 35, 50, 60. You know, so I couldn't think of what exactly I wanted to do because there's so many good ones in there. You know, Big Lebowski, The Dark Knight, um, I was going to do Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull, and then I was going to talk about all the other Indiana Jones movies, and then I realized uh, Crystal Skull is pretty horrible, so I don't think I want to do that. So then I went and did, um, so I looked it up, and the first movie that popped up there that was, or well, the last movie in the list that was 100 years old is a movie called Tarzan the Ape Man from 1918. And like I said, I love those old movies. I know some of you may be like, oh my God, it's black and white. It's silent. I fucking hate it. I'm not going to watch it. But uh, I found it on YouTube. And if you like old movies, you should check it out. It was filmed in Louisiana and all the extras are from there. And they say that it was pretty much directly following the book. And I, I watched it. It's like, you know, 100 minutes or maybe less. No, an hour. It's like an hour and seven minutes something like that, an hour and two minutes, whatever. And um, and it was it was good. And then I almost watched the newest, because I wanted to compare the two. I was going to watch the newest Tarzan with Margot Robbie, but I said no. I changed my mind. I watched, they had a free thing for the first 10 minutes of it, and I watched that, and I was like, nah, I think I'm good. What was good with that was that they started Tarzan already. He's already been here in, or he's been in London for a while now, living there, before he goes back to, you know, to his country to see all of his people and all that. Uh, I mean, all of his animal friends and everything. So, some uh, movies that I found out, some, like, trivia or history or whatever that I found was uh, movies that were released this week in August through the years were American Graffiti, opened on August 11th, 1973, before Star Wars, of course. And uh, Bambi opened August 13th, 1942. And they said, what's funny about this, I have never seen this movie. I understand the mom dies and all this stuff, but I've never seen the movie. Um, maybe I'll watch it soon. Maybe I'll watch it for the next two weeks, uh, for the next show. Um, I bought it for my wife, but I haven't watched it. It's on Blu-ray. But what's interesting with that is they said that it, um, it was a flop when it came out, but now it has made like three hundred million dollars. So they <laughs> they made their money back a little bit. Um, Fast Times at Richmond High opened August thirteenth, nineteen eighty two. That Cars music and Phoebe Cates coming out of the water. Oh my God, so good. Um, 
and Bonnie and Clyde opened August 13th, 1967. And uh, that was that was what changed kind of Hollywood. Like Hollywood at that time was kind of older, older school kind of Hollywood. And this was, you know, 1967. And it was it had blood. He shot that guy in the face. It jumped on the running board from the bank, tried to stop the car. Like, oh, it was good stuff. Um, so <clears throat> now we get to movies reviewed and discussed. Now, with me by myself doing this show, it's a little tougher than me with somebody to discuss back and forth. So what's good about the show, Me Love and Movies, is that I can do this by myself. What else is good is when my friends are available, they can do the show with me. So, um... So I said that I wasn't going to do an anniversary show because there are too much to choose from. And then I found Touch of Evil on Netflix. So I was looking up classic movies that I could watch, something that I could review that was good. And I found Touch of Evil on Netflix. And I was like, oh, my God, this is great. And then it just happened that the movie came out in 1958. So it's 60th anniversary of Touch of Evil. And I also found Out of Sight was on Netflix as well. And that came out in 1998, and it is the 20th anniversary of that movie. So I was like, oh, my God, that's awesome. So I said, I'll watch those two. So for those of you who do not know, Touch of Evil, the plot of Touch of Evil from 1958, it's a stark, perverse story of murder, kidnapping, and police corruption in a Mexican border town. Boom. Sold. Where do I sign up? I'll see this movie. Yeah, I fucking love it. Um, It has this incredible opening shot. It's directed by Orson Welles, written by Orson Welles, based on the novel Badge of Evil. Um, The cinematography was by Russell Meddy. I'm going to always put the cinematography in here because sometimes I believe cinematographer and the director work together and they have some really good stuff. Um... It stars Charlton Heston, Janet Lee, Orson Welles, Marlene Dietrich, a guy named Dennis Weaver, who I know maybe a lot of you haven't heard of. Dennis Weaver was in McLeod in the 70s, TV show that I grew up with. It's like a, a cop procedural. He was like a Texas cop, wore a cowboy hat, but uh, did stuff in L.A. Um, he's also from Gunsmoke, and he was also in Steven Spielberg's first movie called Duel. And it had Zsa, Zsa Gabor. She showed up for like a second. So this movie, there's an opening shot in the beginning of the movie that kind of sets up. It's almost like a MacGuffin because nobody else knows that this guy puts a bomb in this person's trunk. And the guy and the girl get in the car and they're driving. And the camera is following them while they're driving down the street. And they drive by um, by Charlton Heston and Janet Lee. Now the camera's with Charlton Heston, Janet Lee, and they're talking and they're walking. And then they walk by the car, and then you see the car again. And they check in, and they go across the border, and they walk across the border. And then the car drives away, and Charlton Heston and her are talking. And all of a sudden, boom, there's an explosion off camera. And Charlton Heston is like a, a, uh, he works for the DEA, and he has to go investigate. And he investigates to find out what's going on and they find out that it was kind of a guy that's important they got blew up and they have to now track down where the dynamite came from Orson Welles is a sheriff um and uh for this town uh in on the um on the Mexican border and um in the Mexican town and then um uh, Charlton Heston plays a Mexican uh, that uh, works in, I believe, America. But anyway, um, so now he's with the sheriff and they're trying to investigate. And the sheriff is somehow like, oh, look, we found the dynamite. Uh, did you find that dynamite? Yeah, we did. Okay. Like everything is like seems like he's just leading this investigation to go a certain way. And Charlton Heston's like, wait a minute. No, I didn't see the dynamite in there when I just knocked that box over. And he starts realizing that, wait a minute. So he starts investigating Orson Welles on his own wall while Orson Welles is doing his own thing. 
And then there's these two, these brothers and this uncle, and they're all like doing their thing, and they kidnap Janet Lee, and just really good and tight movie, and it was so good, and it's not even that long. I mean, it's a, like two hours, but it's really good. Um, it just kind of rolls along, and uh, Orson Welles said what he wanted from this when he made the movie was for it to kind of be like the big sleep where nobody kind of knows what the movie's really about, but it's really good, but you kind of can't piece all the stuff together. But I think it worked out good, you know, with them investigating Orson Welles' character and all of that stuff. So it worked out. It, it's a really good movie. It's on Netflix. It's called Touch of Evil. Um, please see it. Write me any comments or anything about the movie because I would love to hear about it. Now on here, I have some trivia for the film. The opening scene is one of the easiest tracking shots and the longest, three and a half minutes. Um, Orson Welles said that this was the most fun he'd ever had filming a picture, unlike most of his Hollywood films, because he wasn't troubled by studio interference until after he completed the picture anyway. He was given a healthy budget, and he was working with a crew of some of his favorite actors on a script that didn't involve as much symbolism and all-out cinematic tricks as something like Citizen Kane. Now, if you guys have not seen Citizen Kane, I know it may be a boring movie, but that movie looks so beautiful. So many great shots in that movie. I just, oh my God, so good. I can't even, you know, leave me some other time. We'll talk about that, but... Um, another one, Orson Welles actually transformed himself with 30 kilograms of body prosthetics and makeup, along with a fake nose to play a man 20 years older than himself. Of course, in later life, he physically came to resemble his character, you know, because then he got big and fat. But everybody thought it was really him, but it's not. He had prosthetics on that made him look fat. And in the movie, Charlton Heston plays a Mexican. He cited not doing a Hispanic accent for his Mexican narcotics officer, Miguel Mike Vargas, as one of the biggest mistakes he ever made as an actor. And uh, something to look for if you're watching the movie, if you do watch a movie, if you haven't seen it yet, Janet Lee broke her left arm after filming commenced, but appeared nonetheless. The arm was in a cast hidden from the camera for many scenes, in the more revealing motel scenes, the cast was removed for filming and reapplied afterwards. Wouldn't that suck? Like, I wore a cast once, and I'm just thinking, like, if they go, we got to take it off, I'd be like, well, wait, I want it to heal right. Like, I'm worried, you know. But I guess if you're an actress, you're going, sure, I'm getting paid. Um, there's a cool scene in the movie where Charlton Heston and his friend Schwartz are driving in a convertible, and the camera's on the hood. And it is really them driving, and not just this is what, I, and not just them in the f in front of a screen with a process shot. That marks the first time that a scene with dialogue was shot for real in a genuine moving car. And I remember watching that, and they're hitting like some, you know, when you go through a through a uh, uh, through a intersection, and your car kind of bounces. The car's bouncing, and it's just kind of all over a little bit, but they're just talking and cruising pretty fast, and it looks really good, and I could see that being like, this is amazing, you know. Um, the film was a box office failure in the U.S. in 1958. Curtis Hansen cited this film as a major influence on L.A. Confidential in 1997, and L.A. Confidential is such a great film, like, so good. Um, you should see that. That's on Netflix as well, so you can check that out. I was talking about Ed Wood earlier. Well, in the movie Ed Wood, the Orson Welles character complains to the Ed Wood character about administrative meddling in a director's artistic vision. I'm supposed to do a thriller with Universal, but they want Charlton Heston to play a Mexican, referring to this film. In reality, Heston's character was originally supposed to be white. It was Welles himself who changed it to a Mexican. So, fake news, I wrote. Uh, Wood also tells Wells, I've even had producers recut my films, a significant issue, as it turns out for Wells, with this film. Because then they recut it, and Wells had to write a thing, which I'll get to in a second. Um, <clears throat> so, I love, this is from me, I love Dennis Weaver's character in this movie. He's so funny and different. The role of the mo 
of the motel night manager that he plays was written specifically for him because Wells admired his work on Gunsmoke from 1955. That's when Gunsmoke started. It was a, one of the longest running TV shows next to um, a Hawaii Five-0, the original, and wanted to work with him. So that's why he cast Dennis Weaver. When Orson Welles discovered that this film was recut, he wrote a 58-page letter to the production house with specifics on how he would have wanted the film to be released. This memo, thought to be lost, was found to be in the possession of star Charlton Heston and was a basis of the re-edited 1998 re-release, which is what you'll see on Netflix. According to a September 4, 1960 New York Times article, Marlena Dietrich considered the role of Tana one of her favorites, and claimed that she did her best dramatic acting in the last scene in which she declares, what does it matter what you say about people? She also stated that her scenes were shot all in one night. Now that is kind of iffy because that article came out in 60 and the movie came out in 58, so maybe she did better stuff after that than she thought, but at least that's what was written then. So it's it's a great movie, and you should all see it. And I don't mean to just go, this is a good movie, you should see it. But, you know, you should see it. (laughs) So, the next one that I saw, pretty much right after that, was Out of Sight. And this movie, I saw Out of Sight in the theater. And it's a career bank robber bust out of jail, Clooney, with the help of his buddy, Rames, and kidnaps a U.S. Marshal, Lopez, Jennifer Lopez, in the process. When the two cons head for Detroit to pull off their final big scam, the marshal is put on their case, but she finds she is attracted to one of them and has second thoughts in bringing them in. Now this was directed by Steven Soderbergh. It's written by Elmore Leonard. The novel was written by Elmore Leonard. And as Scott Frank did the screenplay. Now Elmore Leonard, this time, Get Shorty had come out, Jackie Brown, and then this movie. And uh, Scott Frank did the screenplay. It was really good dialogue. I'm sure some of it is directly from the Elmore Leonard book. Cinematography was Elliot Davis. Stars George Clooney, Jennifer Lopez, Ving Rhames, Don Cheadle, Dennis Farina, Albert Brooks, Louis Guzman, Catherine Keener, Steve Zahn, a young Viola Davis, Samuel Jackson, and Michael Keaton is Ray Nicolette, which is the same character that he played in Jackie Brown. So it was really cool to see that character when he came on there, when he came on the thing. Now, when it came on screen, I love this movie because seeing it in the theater, I love those kind of heists. I love the gritty movies like that. That's why I probably like um, Touch of Evil. I love those film noir because they're gritty films. Um, I love this movie because it's like a bank. It's a it's a bank robbery. Then he gets caught. And then he gets put in prison. And then he breaks out and then they're going to go do this this big heist um on this guy's house and it's just you know really good and the two friends like it's funny what i noticed in this was um if you watch a movie again it's on netflix is um ving rames character is like a real soft teddy bear type when he's talking to george clooney um he always has Ving Rhames character always has um, he'll talk to his sister every night before he goes to bed and she'll he'll tell her about something that he did wrong and she'll tell him how he's going to go to hell and she'll pray for him and all this stuff and so he's conflicted there a little bit but what's but then still pulls off these crimes but what's funny is he'll be that way but then when he's in front of Don Cheadle and Don Cheadle's like bodyguard like he's just giving shit like he don't care like he could back himself up you know and him and him and George Clooney are too like just talking tough and I love that too just guys that talk tough it's just you know in movies like if they can back it up like you can see Charles Bronson talking tough maybe he wasn't tough maybe some of these characters people that we know movies that we grew up with like maybe you know they couldn't defend themselves or get in a fight but you know, sometimes if you get the right actor, you go, oh, yeah, I could see that guy handling his own shit. You know, it's like Robert Downey Jr. talking about when he was in jail um, for the heroin stuff. And uh, he just walked up to a guy that was sitting at a table that had 
he knew that he had to knock this guy out. And so he just walked up, punched the guy, knocked him out. And, you know, so you're like, oh, shit, okay, there's more to Robert Downey Jr. than I thought, you know. So it's uh, it's really cool. But um, so definitely see that movie. It's, it, you know, people say, you know, that there's an opening scene that Joe and I always make fun of. Uh, not make fun of. We do home. On, we uh, do the movie line, and it's uh, it's uh, they're talking about the movie Network, and he goes, "What was that movie about TV?" And she goes, "Network." And he goes, "Yeah, with uh, that guy that said I'm not going to take any more of your, uh, I'm not going to take any more shit." And she goes, "Peter Finch." And he goes, "Yeah, I'm not going to take any more of your shit." And what he said was, "I'm not going to take it anymore." Um, he just said, "You know, I'm not going to take it anymore." And he took it as, you know, I'm not going to take any more of your shit. It was just funny because he, you know, got it wrong, but in a funny way. Um, so uh, so it's it's just good from the opening. You know, it's got that Steve Soderbergh stuff where it's like freeze frame. Um, and then we'll continue and do all this stuff. And, you know, oh, it's just a good little cop thing. Like the cops are trying to find him. He's trying to get away and. They're both in love. J Lo and him like have this like he's just attracted to her, and she is attracted to him, and so you don't know where it's going. And they're playing like this cat and mouse game almost. So, um, please check it out. It's on Netflix. Um, again, it's like a two-hour movie. It's really good. Highly recommend it. But uh, now here's some trivia. Sandra Bullock almost got the part of Karen Sisko. But director Steven Soderbergh was against it. He said, I spent some time with Clooney and Bullock, and they actually did have a great chemistry, but it was for the wrong movie. I'm sure they could do a movie together, but not an Elmore Leonard movie. Clooney and Bullock appeared later in Gravity in 2013. This is one of George Clooney's favorite films on his resume. He said, it was the first time where I had a say, and it was the first good screenplay I'd read where I just went, that's it. Even though I didn't do, even though it didn't do very well in the box office wise, we sort of tanked again. It was a really good film. Um, the trunk scene, which I just talked about, kind of in the beginning, a little bit after they escape um, from jail, and they throw her in the trunk to kidnap her um, with George Clooney. The trunk scene was shot forty-five times. However, none of these takes were used in the final cut, as the test audience disliked the long single take. The scene, as it appears in the movie, was a reshoot. The original long take is available on the DVD extras. And I remember I had the DVD, and I watched that, and I remember just being like, oh, my God, come on. Like, it did take too long. The way they do it now is perfect. Like, it, it's just perfect and tight and good. Um, Samuel L. Jackson and Michael Keaton did their cameos free of charge. Uh, when Jack sees a photo of Karen's father, he remarks that wh- her father is Dennis Farina. He marks that he has a cop's face. In real life, Dennis Farina, Marshall Sisko, is a former Chicago police officer. As an actor, the late Farina had several roles as a cop. I thought this was kind of funny. That's what I wrote. Sorry, I put in my own words there. Um, oh, I'm sorry. So, I'm sorry. That was <laughs> that was a separate thing that I said was funny. The but the about uh, the former Dennis Farina because he died now, in real life. Uh, but as an actor, he had several roles as a cop. And his first movie was Thief. And he was actually a Chicago police officer, like it says, a detective. And in Thief, he played a bad guy. And one of the bad guys played a cop. And so it was really good. And then, then he was in a, a movie called uh, Crime Story. And it was him being a being a cop and uh, in like uh, gangster Chicago, I think, or gangster L.A. But anyway, it was really good. Um, and then um, this is what I thought was funny. Jennifer Lopez had to screen test for the part of Karen Sisko. The scene chosen was the intimate one between Lopez and George Clooney in the trunk of a car and acted on a couch at Clooney's house. Lopez later joked that that was her only brush with the casting couch. Um, Miramax Films owned the rights to Ray Nicolette's character due to the fact that Jackie Brown went into production first. Quentin Tarantino felt it was imperative that Miramax not charge Universal for using the character. This move gave Universal Pictures enough leeway to use the film's character free of charge from Miramax. 
Michael Keaton's limited appearance as Ray Nicolette was a much more substantial element of Jackie Brown. So he had a bigger part in Jackie Brown, but I love that character in Jackie Brown because you'd never seen kind of Michael Keaton do that kind of character. And it was really good, like a cop, like chewing gum, like just, it was cool. Um, George Clooney claimed that he was four pages into reading Scott Frank's screenplay when he was convinced that he had to appear in this film. Jennifer Lopez trained for 10 weeks with a real FBI agent learning how to shoot sniper rifles. Um, the scenes at Glades were filmed at Angola Prison in Louisiana, where 500 real cons were used as extras. Catherine Keener, she's from, uh, you know, the, um, what was that movie that just came out with, um, ah, with the sink, with the dark place and the sink. Anyway, you know who Catherine Keener is. She was in 40-Year-Old Virgin, uh, was originally slated to play Karen Sisko role. But instead, she plays uh, Jack's ex-wife. She plays uh, Clooney's ex-wife. In November 2008, Entertainment Weekly magazine ranked Out of Sight as number one in their list of sexiest movies ever. And it is pretty sexy. It's a good little, you know, kind of old school, almost like the original Thomas Crown Affair. Um, and then um, they even talk about in the beginning of this movie, the uh, um, Three Days of the Condor, how they kind of... Those characters, um, Robert Redford and uh, um, what's her name, fell in love so quick. Um, a spinoff of a television show was made based upon and titled with the name of Jennifer Lopez's character called Karen Sisko, starring Carla Gugino in the title role. It only lasted one season. Many indus industry insiders felt that the film was mismarketed by Universal Pictures and should have been released in the fall, where there were less competition and no summer blockbusters. I agree. This movie is like kind of a smaller movie, and um, um, Steven Soderbergh said this was his first kind of Hollywood movie instead of artsy movie, but this movie would have been like, it would have done better, I think, had it been released or maybe even marketed in a different way. I think the way it was marketed made me laugh, but maybe some people were like, I don't get it. But it was good. I liked it. Um, the fish tank in Richard Ripley's house has some of the same species from Finding Nemo that Albert Brooks voiced Marlin in Finding Nemo and Finding Dory. So Albert Brooks is in the movie and he owns a fish tank. And in there are the fish, those clown fish, like he played in Finding Nemo and Finding Dory. Um, the only non-Best Picture Oscar nominee that year to be nominated for Best Editing. <clears throat> so everyone check out these movies on Netflix and let me know what you think, please. Like I said, either go on Instagram um, under my celluloid heart or send an email to my celluloid heart at gmail.com. Um, some new movie trailers. I only have one that I watched. I'll have more later. Maybe um, widows with Viola Davis, Liam Neeson, Michelle Rodriguez, Colin Farrell, from a book by Gillian Flynn, who wrote Gone Girl. They just came out with this new trailer. And the the first trailer was, was cool. This one's even better, because the girls are more badass. I'm hoping they're not going to give too much away. But it's directed by Steve McQueen. Not the Steve McQueen, but the guy that directed 12 Years a Slave. And <clears throat> this movie... Um, Viola Davis and uh, and Michelle Rodriguez, like their husbands are going to do a crime and they get killed by the police. Either all of them get killed or whatever. Viola Davis finds the plans for their next heist that they were going to do. And so she decides that her and these girls are going to train and practice and go over and m figure out how to pull off this heist and they're going to do it. And it's really good. So it's called A Widow's. Yeah, so I guess they didn't get captured. They're dead. So it's called The Widows, and it's trailer number two. Um, so check that one out. It's really good. Um, for movie news, uh, Disney refuses to hire James Gunn. They've made their final announcement. No, we're not going to rehire James Gunn for Guardians of the Galaxy 3. So that's sad but true. You know, it happens. Um, there's a robot that Tony K is do, directing a movie. I hadn't heard of Tony K since American um 
since American History X. So um, when I read this article, I was like, oh, Tony K is doing a new movie. So a real robot will take the lead in director Tony K's new movie. So that's like crazy. Like, I think they think it's actually, you know, says American History X director Tony K is looking to cast an artificial intelligent robot in his upcoming comedy, Second Born. K and producer Sam Coase are looking for a way around the use of computer-generated effects in favor of a physical AI robot as an actor, which will be trained in different techniques. K and Coase are hoping to reboot the hoping the robot will receive Screen Actors Guild recognition. Second Born is a sequel to a movie called First Born, which is an indie comedy directed by Ali Atshanti and stars Val Kilmer, Tom Berenger, Greg Grunberg, Jay Abdo, Taylor Cole, Rexa Zizzo, Safai, William Baldwin, Denise Richards, and Robert Nepper. Uh, Tony K hopes to train his robot in many different acting techniques for Second Born. It isn't clear how the movie will work out logistically, but K is serious about the about the next endeavor. So I I'm not sure about this. I mean, um, it's like it's an innovative idea. I agree with this article, but however, it will be very interesting to see the idea is embraced when Second Born hits theaters. Will a robot have a chance of winning a Golden Globe or Academy Award? No. Um, that could very well be the case in the near future if this idea actually works. Tony K may be the first in a long line of directors who decide to ditch egos of human actors and actresses to work with robots who will be trained not to argue. So I don't know. I mean, I'm going to check out this first movie called, uh, you know, Firstborn. But yeah, I just, I don't, I don't get it. So... So that one's interesting. Um, so that was some news. The other one is Rambo 5 is going to start shooting soon. And the synopsis is, it sounds pretty good. Rambo teams up with a journalist to track down and rescue a group of local girls that have been kidnapped by a Mexican sex trafficking ring after trying to settle down to a quiet, peaceful life stateside at the family ranch in Arizona after spending decades abroad. So... I uh, I think that'll be good. Um, on that website where I found the article was uh, they had some um, some casting like some actors doing scenes and um, looked pretty cool. Looked like it could be good, so I'm all for it. My friend Sergio he didn't like the last Rambo movie, but I loved it. So and a lot of people did, but um, so I'm all for it. Um, it took a while for Rambo to grab that bow and arrow, but when he killed that first guy, you were like, yes, it was awesome. Um, so now we're on to the hidden gem part, and then I'll be letting you all go. But uh, hidden gem this week is The Way of the Gun, which is directed by Christopher McQuarrie, written by Christopher McQuarrie, starring Benicio Del Toro, Ryan Philippi, Juliette Lewis, Jeffrey Lewis, her father, um, James Kahn and Tay Diggs, among others. But what I loved about this movie, you, you've probably seen there's that opening scene where um, there's a party going on. These people are waiting to get into a bar. Car alarm goes off. It's Ryan Philippi and Benicio Del Toro sitting on somebody's like Mercedes or BMW. And the guy goes, hey, shit face, get off my car. And um, and then he goes, you know, why don't you shut the fuck up, bro? Come over there and fuck start her head and start talking all the shit. And then they walk over there and they just start beating like they start hitting the women. Um, at least Ryan Phillippe does. And it's a great scene because um, Christopher McQuarrie said that uh, the audio commentary of that is really good. And Christopher McQuarrie recently did the Mission Impossible movies, and he did a uh, Jack Reacher movie. I think he did that recent one. Um, no, maybe he did the first one. And um, and he did, of course, most famously, he wrote Usual Suspects, which is so great. Um, but he is. He said they were playing soccer, and there were dog people. No, they're playing frisbee, and there's dog people while they're playing frisbee. And the dog people and the frisbee people don't get along. 
and he said the frisbee people were getting or the dog people were getting very upset or vice versa whatever he was and he said his friends like well what are we going to do he goes well if we're getting in a fight just start hitting the women and he goes cuz we'll leave we may get fucked up but they have to leave and explain to the women how they didn't get defended you know or whatever so that was his impetus for putting that scene in the movie there's another scene where they have their guns out and everybody's just kind of watching them like people do now. People are more just watching and not realizing how in danger they could be, especially now with camera, you know, now with phones, like everybody just wants to record with their phones. And uh, Ryan Phillip, he has to say, can't you see there are guns here? And then everybody leaves. And um, so it's, it's really good. It's well written. It's another crime, dirty crime movie. Like I like, um, so I think that one's on Netflix, but I'm not sure. It was recently, but I know, don't know if it's gone yet. But you may even be able to find it at, you know, at Walmart for five bucks. And if so, it's definitely worth it. <coughs> it's worth five, seven bucks. It's worth ten bucks. It's worth fifteen bucks. I would say it's worth twenty. But if you haven't seen it, I say go up to ten, seven, seven or ten. Okay. Well, that's my show for this week. Um, Next week, of course, probably talk about uh, the Meg and um, and that uh, the Black Klansman, KKK Um So I'll go see that and um, and whatever else. So um, I hope you all enjoyed the show. I hope I didn't bore you. Like I said, I'll work on some uh, little fixes and some changes that I may be able to do, and um, we'll go from there. So. Until two weeks from now, this is Philip, and thank you for joining me at my celluloid heart. And like I said, send us an email, my celluloid heart at gmail dot com. Check us out on Instagram at my celluloid heart on Instagram, and on Facebook under facebook dot com slash my celluloid heart. So thank you, and have a good one. There are